age settled with more grace on ordinary people. But for celebrities, women in particular, age became a hatchet that vandalized a work of art. Hello, I'm Rebecca Capone. And I'm Kennedy Weibel. And this is Reading Pop Classics. And today we're discussing Valley of the Dolls by Jacqueline Suzanne. Valley of the Dolls follows three women, Ann Wells, Neely O'Hara, and Jennifer North through New York City and Hollywood from the years 1945 through 1964 as they search for power, money, fame, and love during a time when women's greatest ambitions were meant to center solely around marriage and family. This book explores the cost of their ambition along with fame, women's rights, gay rights, and drug addiction, in this case, pills or dolls as our heroines fondly refer to them. Valley was published in 1966 and was the best-selling fiction book the year it was released despite being panned by critics. By 1974, it was in the Guinness Book of World Records as the best-selling fictional work in publishing history with 17 million copies sold. And by 2016, it still retained that title with 31 million copies sold. Valley of the Dolls was made into a movie in 1967 starring Barbara Parkins, Patty Duke, Sharon Tate, and Susan Hayward. It was also wildly successful commercially, but also negatively reviewed. The movie became a pop classic as well. Valley of the Dolls was considered quite risque and controversial at the time that it was published. A department store in Chicago even sold the book from under the counter as if it were pornography. The author, Jacqueline Suzanne, was married to a press agent and producer named Irving Mansfield, and they are considered pioneers of the modern book tour because of the amount of pu uh, publicity that they did to introduce and to kind of keep the excitement going for Valley of the Dolls. Suzanne is considered one of the first celebrity authors, and she was the first author to have three consecutive books make the number one spot on the New York Times bestseller list. Suzanne died in 1974 at the age of 56 after a years long battle with breast cancer. So Kennedy, this was your first time reading Valley of the Dolls. Can you tell us your sort of initial uh, impression of this book? Rebecca, this book is absolutely wild. I'm not sure that I've read something quite like this before. I see the origins in this book of a lot of things that you and I are very familiar with. A lot of our listeners are probably very familiar with from Sex in the City. Uh, to the Kardashians, I would say. And I'm saying the Kardashians, I mean the entire scope of their media empire from keeping up with the Kardashians, the television show, to their cookbooks and their Instagram accounts and sort of the the far sweep of what Makeup they have. Makeup lines, clothing lines. The things that they have put together that are, their empire is built on just the idea of celebrity in general. Yes. And this book seems to both be about that and by someone for whom that was also her life. Like Jacqueline Suzanne seems to be much like the Kardashians, kind of a self-created celebrity. Yes, that is true. Russell Brand is another one like who just sort of showed up fully formed as a celebrity. Maybe there's a preamble in England that I'm not aware of in, in the British Isles where he had a slow come come up to fame. But from my perspective, he just kind of showed up as a celebrity, complete with scandal and intrigue and all of that, just out of the blue. Yes. And Jacqueline, Suzanne, to your point, um, as I mentioned, you know, she was married to someone who was a press agent and a producer, um, and they did they did work together to kind of create her as an author, to make her that celebrity author. It is not solely because she wrote this book and the book was a success. They were behind a lot of that a lot of that success, um, you know, really pushing to go to different bookstores. If they met bookstore owners and they hadn't read the book, then it was just like, well, here's a copy. We've autographed it. People love it. Um, you know, this was a time we didn't have social media. We didn't have publicity and stuff for books um, the way in the marketing for books, the way we do now. And we can really credit them with that. But yes, they kind of created her and made her into this um, into this celebrity. And I do think, I do think that the, I, th I think the book itself, I mean, is something that is popular. It is a, it is a book that people really love, even though critics hated it. Like it came out oh. and people were just like, this is a horrible book. It is a horrible book. It, and I do not mean that as a dig. I enjoyed reading it a lot. I had a lot of fun reading it. It is not literature. This it is, is not literature. this is entertainment. Um, I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing, even though I I'm paraphrasing something someone else probably said about this. 
but it's just like reading a book length page six from the New York Post. Like it's just a celebrity gossip column that goes on for nearly 500 pages. Except yeah. the celebrities aren't real people. They're not actual celebrities that you're the aware of. Are, the characters are loosely based on celebrities from the time. So we see, um, you know, Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe, and some, you know, and some of these characters. And she doesn't pretend that that is not the case. But I, I mean, they're also not biographies of those women by any stretch of the imagination either. I mean, they're they are very loosely based, very loosely based on on women that were famous at the time and that were sort of being put through this ringer um that we that we see our girls going through in valley of the dolls kennedy do you think that this book passes the bechdel test it does but despite the fact that all the main characters are women and lots of the side characters are women it's still close yeah so you know we talked about you, you this is the first time that you have read this book this is not the first time i have read this book this is this is a popular classic with me i read this book for the first time in high school i cannot believe my mother gave me this book to read in high school. I don't think she had read it in many years. I can't believe um, some of the stuff that's in there now reading it. Like we'll and we'll get into it. We don't have to like rip them all like we can we'll focus on the Bechtel test for the moment. But no, there is some stuff in here. My mother did not take the ability to rent rated our movies. Um I, I had like a thing on my blockbuster card until I was legitimately 21 years old that said I could not rent rated our movies from our local blockbuster under our account. And I had to beg her to take it off when I was in college. She gave me this book in high school, like a tender high school, like a 15 sophomore year of high school, not even my senior year. Um, so I don't think she was remembering some of the things that were in it. To mom's um, credit, she did not censor books. That was not her thing. That I've, is fair. And for listeners, uh, if if you don't, if you did not learn this in the first episode, Kennedy and I are brother and sister. We have been reading books together our entire lives. Mom took exactly um, one book away from me when I was a kid, and it was The Godfather. And I remember it so clearly because I was reading it in a chair, like in the living room, and she walked by, and it was like in a like in a cartoon. She did kind of like a slow backward walk and like looked like her head tipped over. And she's like, "What is that?" And I was like, "I got it off your bookshelf." And I remember this like pause where she and she paused, and then there was a sort of, you know what? Not that one. Just not that. Pick. Go pick something else. And that is hilarious to me because I would venture I must, that I'm, 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 has... I, I was probably 11. Like, I realize that is now. Pr- okay, that's, that yeah. is pretty young, I suppose, for The Godfather. Because I was thinking that, I mean, this book, I would venture is... Uh, in terms of things that our mother would not have wanted us reading, I would have thought Valley of the Dolls would trump The Godfather. Which brings us to... Um, so, The Bechdel Test, yes. I had to really... So, I have read this book... I have read this book a handful of times. Every few years, I pull it back out and reread it. It is a fun read. I can get through it really quickly. Um, I just really enjoy this book. And and part of part of rereading it and talking about it on this podcast, I started thinking about like what is it about this book that I really like, um, which is going to bring me to my kind of my first point and, and circle back to the Bechdel test. You know, when I was young, the start of the book, they're going to you know the Copacabana and um, El Morocco. And it just felt like this really glamorous time, you know, back, back in the forties in New York, when, when women dressed up and you went out to these, these fancy places and it just seemed really glamorous to me. Um, I think the like forties, fifties, Hollywood is also something that seems like this really glamorous time, I guess, cause I grew up watching like Nick at night and things like that. Um, and it was a time that people just seemed more like they were dressed nicer um, like you, you dressed to go out to dinner, you dressed for your dates. Things just seemed fancier, I think, back then. And that was something I think that struck me in this book is just that that glamorous old like 50s Hollywood was something I really enjoyed about this book. When they're I not was, in Hollywood, though, we should be clear. They are in New York City. They are in New York City. Um, they do venture to Hollywood, but it does mostly take place it, in New York City. And that it, is like it, it has the celebrity feel of of old entertainment more so yes. than Hollywood specifically, just to not to yes, nitpick, that's but a, that's a better way to say it. So that I think is something that appealed to me when I was young. I think I also just like, couldn't believe I was allowed to read this book. Sex in the city redid this perfectly in the nineties for America at large. When it showed these women dressing up in outfits that were wildly expensive and mm-hmm. going out for, was it Apple Teenies? Cosmos. 
Cosmos, going out for Cosmos at all of these places around New York. It's it did it did the same thing this intro does and what a lot of the book does, which is them going out like name dropping places. Sex in the City did that fit like did a great job of recreating that in a television medium uh, in the 90s through its initial run up to that first movie. And then I hear the wheels kind of came off the wagon for the second movie. I'm not really the target audience for Sex in the City, but I... The and second I heard th- movie, it was terrible. The first movie was mediocre. Um, but I, as I was reading the book this time, I was actually drawing, there are a lot of parallels with Sex in the City. So I do think Darren Starr um, is a fan of Valley of the Dolls. He's very clearly he's very clearly been through this book. He has read this book and enjoys this book. And it was a lot of inspiration, I think, for Sex in the City. That is not something I know to be true. I just am the target audience for Sex in the City. I am the target audience, I think, for Valley of the Dolls. And there are so many parallels. Um, I think, I mean, the big one is the women, the careers are important to the women in Sex in the City. For one, they are looking for, um, they are looking for not fame, but they are looking for success. They are looking for money. They are driven by their careers. Um, and the relationship between Carrie and Mr. Big, I think, parallels Anne and Lion really well, right? That she's con- she's continuously, you know, yeah. with this man who do- who does not want her, but sort of does, right? Or or wants her in his terms. Let's talk about Anne. Anne has the dumbest problems. Her first problem is that the guy she's dating, even though she doesn't really like, but she doesn't know anyone else, so she's letting him take her out. Turns out to be the wealthiest man in all of New York. That's her first problem. Her second problem is she doesn't like Lawrenceville in Connecticut where she's from, or no, Massachusetts, I'm sorry. She doesn't like Lawrenceville in Massachusetts, which when we go back there in the book turns out to be an unbelievably charming town that the man she loves would be happy to settle down with her in. But she's like, absolutely not. This place is awful. And she, it turns out she's like wealthy and lives in a nice house and grew up in... I don't know, middle class digs. Uh, Her other problem is that somebody wants her to be a model. She runs into that problem and she doesn't really feel like it, but fine. Look, she has the stupidest problems. So I did some thinking in this, in this read about Anne, because I felt, I felt really frustrated by Anne. Why does she hate Lawrenceville? It's not explained. It's just like a teenager she just wants more. That I do, that I do get. I legitimately understand that she wants more. She wants to go to New York City for the reasons we were just talking about. This book makes New York City look great. She wants more. She does not want to settle down and be somebody's wife in a small town and have that be it and like that be her whole life. She feels that she has led this very unexciting life. Her 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 mother, her her forebears, right, have led this very unexciting life and Anne simply wants more. And I can respect that. I can respect she wants to move to New York. She doesn't know what she wants to do, but she knows she wants like a cool job and she doesn't want to live in a small town and just be somebody's wife and just be somebody's mother. And that is what is being offered to her. Sure. However, but let me let me counter to say that she does not simply want that. She gets that immediately. She, she does gets get that, that immediately. With no barriers and she overcomes nothing to get it. She doesn't simply want it. She hates Lawrenceville. She despises it for no discernible reason. She is not held back there. She is not, no one's trying to make her stay. In fact, Lawrenceville seems happy to see her grumpy ass go. But Anne, so Anne has, right. So Anne moves to New York. She immediately gets this like sick job. Oh, sick job at like the most popular talent agency. One of the biggest talent agencies in the whole city. Her boss loves her. Her boss thinks she's great. There's very clearly like upward mobility everywhere she goes. People are like, "You're gorgeous. Be a model. You would make a lot of money." Being Everyone keeps telling her how beautiful she is she- to her face, which is a weird thing when you're reading the book. Like, just for people to keep repeating it over and over again. How like beautiful this girl is. That's that's I, she's told all of the time. She legitimately just with no effort at all shows up at a restaurant one day and some guys like, you know what? You're so beautiful. I want to make you famous. And he does. She already has a ton of money, right? By this point, there is one thing in the world that this girl can't have. And it's this idiot lion Burke. And she throws everything away. And it's her constant problem. And she's down at the mouth, the entire book over this one, this one guy who just like, like, and I get it. I get that lion Burke is like hot 
I get that Lion Burke has this like magnetic thing and this is just what she wants. But I truly believe and like, because I, I had to look at it just like, girl, I hate you in this book. Like I'm so angry at her. You have all this stuff. All your friends want, all your two best friends in the world want is money, some, a sense of security, right? From money. That's, that's more what we should say. A sense of security, a sense of freedom from money, which Anne has. Anne is not reliant on a man and has money and does not have to stay in Lawrenceville and does not have to get married for any nope. form of financial security. And she is willing to just be like, to kind of just throw everything away for Lion Burke. Like for this she video. also throws away Lion Burke one time. She doesn't just want Lion Burke. She wants Lion Burke in Manhattan. In yes. In Manhattan. Because Lion Burke agrees early on in the novel to settle down with her in Lawrenceville because he wants to be a writer. And she's like, no, I'd rather, I'd rather like, no, I can't do that. And then he like, their relationship is bizarre from, from jump, from the time they get together. When they do finally get together in Connecticut, they sit down to have a drink. Massachusetts. Uh, no, are they in, uh, no. Lawrenceville's they in, in Massachusetts. Lawrenceville's in Massachusetts. I'm sorry. When they finally get together in Connecticut in New Haven, when they mm -hmm. go up for the trial runs of the Broadway show that Helen Lawson is in and that Neely is in and that Anne and Lyons Agency is representing the stars of, they are down in the hotel bar and they have this conversation where he's like, what are you fighting for, Anne? And she's like, I'm... I, I'm finally fighting for something. And he's like, you are finally fighting for something. And she's like, well, what are you fighting for, Lion? And he's like, you. And she's like, you don't have to fight. Neither, I'm not sure what they're, the dialogue doesn't mean anything. Neither of them are fighting for anything. They changed clothes in their rooms. They came down to this bar. They had exactly one drink. And then they have this conversation that is tied to nothing that has previously happened. Like, there is no point where they couldn't have each other and they're fighting for... There's, that's 100 percent true there is no right Anne's not fighting for anything this whole this whole book this whole book no. I, I guess again, except for lying and it way. sounds like i'm yeah. ripping on it i did really enjoy this but this is a book where if you've taken any kind of writing class and they're like show don't tell show don't tell show don't tell this book just tells everything like every mm -hmm. like statements are the facts of the narrative like they just say Anne and Lion were mad for each other, crazy for each other. There is zero evidence of that on the page. Uh, Neely was a true artist. Zero evidence of that on the page. Like the statement, which is fine, but the statement is just, that's what we have to go on. And we have to believe the narrator that Neely is an artist of such caliber that, that anyone would put up with anything to have her sing a show tune. Which is fun, but it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And I think that's what, and I mean, that's what critics I think are responding to is like, this is to your point, this is not a good book from a literary standpoint. It is not super well written. No. However, it is a great story. Oh, it's a great story. Held, right. Yes. It's very campy. It is very campy. And the movie is as well. When the people and behave, that is what people, and that people is what people behave respond to. wildly. The people like, in this book behave wildly and it is compelling to read. Yes. So, Two people sitting down with with absolutely no prompting and like over a single drink admitting that they've or just telling each other they've been passionately in love with each other, throwing over everything to get back to their hotel room and finally do it. It's fun. It's fun to read. Like, it is. It is like fun to read. Helen Lawson acting like an absolute monster, Neely acting acting like an absolute monster is makes for really compelling fiction. Neely goes from compelling. zero to a hundred in like two seconds, by the way, with absolutely. She does, and I love it. Cause no, I think it's no explanation. When we talk about how this book is written, like, so, you know, I was talking about like, so, you know, when I was young and I read this book, that like glamorous, just like the glamor of New York, that glamor, that old Hollywood, like feel to this book. Um, it, you know, is really what's, what struck me the first time, but all of that is kind of right up front, right? Like once and, and, once Anne and Lion break up the, the first time or whatever, then the book, the book, then the book really flies from there. Like we spend yeah. a lot of time in the first like year or so that we're we're getting to know these women and their success is taking off. And then the book kind of flies from there. And it is a lot of um tell and and not show. But the so world, the world building in the first 
I think it's 50, 50, 65 pages, something like that, where we're getting Anne established. We're meeting Neely. We're meeting Helen Lawson. We're meeting Alan, the millionaire, his father, Gino. We're meeting Lion Burke, Henry Bellamy, George Bellows, the, the large, that's just kind of our principles. There's a much larger cast name. of characters that come along with these people. That intro part is a little slow, but once we, once we get done with the show in New Haven, Connecticut, and Lion and Ann get together, and we get back to New York, and Neely's on stage, uh, then we're kind of cooking. Yeah. The book, the book is a just a, it's a rocket car from that point out. It is. But yeah, so in this in this reading, I absolutely. I was, I was really angry at Anne. And so I had to really kind of sit down and think about like what it is, uh, you know, what it is. And I, I think it's just that Lion is kind of the one thing she can't have. She's, she always has comfort, right? Like she grows up in a family that is not necessarily like wealthy, wealthy, but like they're not hurting for anything. Strong middle class. She could marry Willie Henderson. Her mother points out like Willie Henderson is, is rich. He has money. So like, that's a good, a good match. She's, she could marry Alan. He's rich. She makes her own money. She always has a good, like, reliable job. You know, she doesn't have she doesn't have to get married. Lion is the only thing that she can't have. He's just the only thing that she can't have. Or in this case, she can't have the way she wants him. She can't have him the way she wants him. The way him. she wants him. And she throws everything away for that. And in that case, I've decided that after, like, this read made me just, like, I'm over Anne. Like, I, 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 I. Anna's ridiculous that that was and how I, I felt in this in this particular read of this and book. I will say I'm kind of dogging it for not being like or I'm not dogging it. I enjoyed it but we are talking about how it's like not really literature her character does maintain that throughout though like she is the fact that she can't have him the way she wants is consistent with the way her character is written she when she breaks up with Alan after she prior when Alan thought they were still engaged uh, she had arranged for Alan, Alan's father, to go to Boston. No, I'm sorry, to go to Philadelphia to see Helen Lawson in the stage show that none of them want to go to, but they were going because Anne asked, and Anne asked, Anne asked because Helen Lawson wants to marry Alan's father, Gino, who doesn't like her at all, has made it very clear that he doesn't like her, but Anne is just like, oh, you'll be fine. No, you like her. You like her. Like, she is manipulative. And when she breaks up with Alan, he gets all mad on the phone. She asks if Gino can still go to Philadelphia. Yeah. After he does it and he starts to hang up on her, she's like, wait, wait, one more thing. And he's like, yes. And she's like, you're still going to Philly, right? She genuinely thinks that's a normal thing to ask and that he might still be going with his father to set her father, set his father up with this woman he is verbally told everyone he does not like. And she seems annoyed that he won't do it. And it that he won't do it. And she's like yeah. disbelieving that he won't do it. And then she's she treats Kevin Gilmore the same way when she yeah. throws him over for Lion. Then this is a man who has made her famous and has made her rich. She keeps talking about him as though he is being a petulant child because she is leaving her long-term relationship with him to just go bang this dude who showed up back from who has England. Told her that he, who has told her, I am going back to England. Hasn't spoken to her in 15 years. Nothing has changed between us. I want to do it with you while we're here in New York. I, I literally just want to have sex with you while I'm here in New York and have it be like it was for that brief amount of time we were together. But then I'm going back to the way things have been for the past 15 or 20 years or whatever it's been since we dated. And she comes to Kevin of like, listen, I'm going to go do this. And if you're around when I come back, cool. And Kevin shows her the door. And I, for one, felt, I really felt for both Alan and Kevin. In oh, this yeah. Week, this like, Alan had it. Alan had it coming. Yo, man, you are horrible. Like the balls on this woman. Yeah. Honestly. Alan kind of had it coming. She treats these two men is is. Pretty horrible. And um, I mean, men do some pretty horrible things in this book, but Anne. Yes, um, they do. They really do. But Anne. She also has the nerve to talk about Kevin because Kevin's upset, obviously. And when he gets upset, she's like, he's just a child. He doesn't understand. She ta she talks down to him mm -hmm. as though the fact that she is sleeping with someone else outside of their previously monogamous relationship, as though like he's just such an immature little speck little worm for not getting that she's going to do this and that he the fact that he has a reaction and emotions about it is like disdainful 
to her. The relationship with him is very similar to Alan. Like she's with Alan in the beginning yeah. because it's just like a guy who will take her out and she doesn't know anybody and she feels bad for him. And Kevin also just sort of like wears her down on like, well, all these other men hit on me. All I want is lying and I can't have it. I guess I'll just date this guy because he's nice. Until Lion comes back around and she throws him over just like she does to Alan. And I think that, you know, and yes, like she's just so egregious about the way that she ends the relationship with these men. She says of Kevin, the guy who makes her a model and makes her famous, she had enjoyed his company and she found dating one man easier than resisting the advances of many. And that's how she views him. He's easier than telling a bunch of guys no. Because she's also lazy. So she's also lazy. Yeah. Yeah. She is lazy. So something I want to talk about. So we, I want to circle back around to like the Bechdel test and like a, a sort of major point I have. And I've always had sort of a fascination with, with substance use and, and, and reading about it. I've always sort of enjoyed literature and stuff that, that, that circles around that. I just think it's an interesting um, topic. I, 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 you an and everybody else. That's a really popular genre of, of, of book. It's a popular topic. It is a popular genre of book. It's fascinating. It is because it is legitimately something that you could that you see and that you can see in your every maybe not your everyday life, but like it's that you can see and, and know, right? Like substance use, substance use, substance abuse, which are different things, are are a part of our world every day, all of the time, right? This is something that you you can know somebody who who uses and someone who abuses. You can see those differences. It's interesting to read about them and and the processes and the, the thoughts behind it. But as I've gotten older and I've read this book, there are times I've, I've come in and out of viewing it as like a feminist book. So in this read, again, like for one, I was trying to think like, what is it that I love about this book? And how has this book changed for me from reading it at 15 to reading it at 39? Right. And then I've read it, like I said, five, this is probably like my sixth time reading it, maybe because um, it's just like a comfort book that I like to go back to. And then so, you know, when I was going through, like trying to find conversations um, to whether or not this passed the Bechdel test, most of the conversations circle back to men. So they these women do talk about their careers, but it does often circle back to the relationships that 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 they're in or that they wish that they were in. And there were really very few conversations like, you know, we talked about it passes the Bechdel test, but just which kind of amazed me, because if if you for our listeners, if you listen to the episode before this, when we announced that we were going to be doing Valley of the Dolls next, it was like, well, that one's definitely going to pass the Bechdel test. And then like, I had to really dig through this book to find conversations that did not have any mention of a man. So it, it got me thinking, you know, I, for years have viewed this as a feminist book because this is a book about women. And this goes back to Anne for all the women in this book, this goes back to women that want more. These are not women that simply want to accept that this, you know, society is telling them like your place is to be a wife and a mother and a, and a, a homemaker. And that's what women do. And that is not what these women want. And this book goes over how hard it is to be a woman and to want more. You know, they are constantly, you know, the, the, the quote that we picked to start is that, you know, Everything that we learn about these women is that they're beautiful. Everything we, you know, we hear about Helen Lawson. Helen Lawson is talented and she used to be at attractive enough that they would, you know, use her talent on the stage. But now she's, she's middle-aged and, oh, yeah, you know, her a... jawline is gone. She's fat. Like when Neely gains weight in the sanatorium, they call her like, they've chiseled her down from a mammoth mountain of flesh. Like the ways they call women fat fat in this book are hilarious. I've never seen so many, I don't even want to use the word euphemisms. They're not euphemisms. They're, they're not euphemisms. They, they refer to Neely as they finally got her down to being just a whale. Like they, it's the really horrible things. The horrible Mir things where they talk about women, like women's weight and age in this book. Although they're actually, I find, I find age to be treated a little bit hilariously because. Um, that's also Jacqueline Suzanne. That is not so like with Neely, it's characters saying it about Neely and like, Maybe these are shallow, mean characters, and and most of them are self-involved, petty people. But the chapter um, where we are with Miriam, who is Tony Palomar's sister. Tony Polar. Tony Polar, sorry. Tony Polar's sister, who takes care of all of his accounts and runs his life. And, and we find out it's because he's got the- he um, Some sort the, of disability, right? He is the intelligence of a 10-year-old boy. 
but in the chapter where we start with her, where there are no other characters talking about her, just the narrator calls her fat and talks about her fat fingers dialing the phone. Mm. The author hates her, and the author doesn't like fat people. That is purely well, Jack, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Suzanne, Suzanne. Does not like fat, unattractive no. people. And for what it's worth, Jacqueline Suzanne is neither heavy or unattractive. She's a nice looking, thin. Well, you know, she was a nice looking and thin and thin woman. It caught my. It caught. It caught me when I was reading it because it's an omnipotent narrator having a an opinion about this character who we haven't really seen before, and it's very clear that the omnipotent narrator dislikes this person dislikes this woman and part of yes. it is that and she and she lets us know that by calling her fat yeah a, a couple times it is not another character being mean or doing something in character saying something petty it is just the the author decided to be mean about this character who she invented and decided to be mean about her by making her fat and then talking about it right and so you know miriam his sister is she's not famous and she's not trying to be famous, right? So at the end of the day, she's a businesswoman. And so neither her looks nor her size should should make a difference, right? It, it shouldn't necessarily. I mean, the amount that the amount that age and, and looks and um, weight are talked about in this book is incredible. But I but I do think that that is but that is not I mean, that is something that we put female celebrities through right that is something that we still put female celebrities to even though now we have a movement you know we have this more like big is beautiful movement um you know or you know where you could be beautiful at every size right like there's a lot more body acceptance now but at the same time you know this this is still a big part of of hollywood a big part of being a woman i think in general is your looks and your weight are a huge thing so i did not so initially so initially you know i had viewed it as like a feminist book right these these are women that, that dare to want more and then we are seeing we we are we see how it's it's more challenging for women right to to get to the top to achieve success and and fame and that kind of thing and so from that, you know, from that stance, um, it is a feminist book. We have the, the characters in the book have, have an, have an abortion, right? You know, they actually ex exercises her right to abortion in the book, you know, so some of these things we can see is very feminist. And then as I was like, again, you know, trying to figure out if this passed the Bechdel test or is trying to find like point to like, yes, see, here's a conversation where they don't discuss men. I thought there would be so many and there, you know, it barely passed. This is a feminist book, the way cigarettes are a diet helper. Like it might do yes. that. That's not what it's for. Like the that's way that's not what it's for. Viagra might save a marriage, but that's not what the pill was invented for. <laughs> retin, -A, retin A might get rid of your wrinkles, but that it's an off-label use. This book is a this book is this book's feminism is off label, in my opinion, and it it exists because the book dares to be about women, but it dares to be about women and it dares to pull no punches and to have them like you say, they just very matter of factly have abortions. One character I think has something like twelve. Yes. She has, yes, she does. She mentions at some point that she she has the one that we that we're that's discussed more, right? Tony Poehler's baby after Miriam talks about why she doesn't want her to go through with the pregnancy. She, she, she drops some other number very casually later in the book where she's like, "I've had seventeen. I can get pregnant really easily. I get pregnant all the time." Right. It did pull back the curtain, so to speak, for me on on the feminism of the book. For one, for women, for one, they're they're, they're punished. They're punished for their ambition, every single one of them, whether they deserve it or not. Jennifer is the one that I felt was punished and the one I felt bad for. Neely is a monster. Neely is a monster. Anne, I, again, I just don't feel like Anne has any ambition. Anne wanted to just sit and be a secretary in New York, and she just kind of falls ass backwards into money, power, uh, fame, men, like her relationships, her child. Like she just, kind of lands on all these things without much effort at all she does but some so some other things i think that make this not and, and is punished i guess and Anne is punished and i mean and jennifer is definitely punished and that's that's the one that feels jennifer is absolutely punished if she's the one that it feels the least you feel the worst for jennifer jennifer is, jennifer and henry bellamy are the two nicest people in this book yes they're and... the best they are the best friends they are the nicest people they don't trash everyone around them all of the time 
But let's finish what you're talking about. Like, is this feminist? So I, this jokingly, feminist? I'm so saying it has like an off-label use as feminism. I think that's still, I actually think that's better if I'm being, I think that points to a better story. Um, I think uh, just something modern that most people have probably seen, Mean Girls. Mm -hmm. Mean Girls is, I would say that what makes it a feminist movie is that it is about women. It's not about them and from through a feminist lens. It is just a story about them. I'll take I'll take that. And I will take it as feminist, like I said, in that these are women that are trying to have some something else, something besides besides motherhood and and being a wife, right? Which which at the time is kind of the the big offer on the table. Um at the time that this book at the time that this book came out. And and if and while of course there is nothing wrong with with being a wife and a mother. And if, you know, it, but it's, but it's the choice of, of being able to have that and, and, or being able to do something else, if that's what you want, like that, that is not the sole role that those are not the two sole roles that women can fill. And I think being allowed to be bad characters, it, uh, not bad as in badly written, but I think being allowed to be bad, like a, like a female character being allowed to be imperfect, um, to be something more complex than just the the virgin or I'm uh, sorry, the, the Madonna or the whore, right. Being allowed to be something in between the fact that Anne is allowed to be self-involved sort of ambitionless and manipulative. And that she is a main character throughout this book. That's representation. Like not everybody wants to be included in things just to be the, the token good person that we've put in just to have the representation. Like the fact that Neely is allowed to be a monster and a main character the fact that Jennifer is allowed to be a character of Shakespearean tragedy, essentially, is is important. I think that's what kind of points to it being a feminist book. I do have one bone to pick with the social justice aspect of this novel. And on the back of my book, it says that, you know, this was an all-time pop culture classic, a pioneering work that tackled women's rights. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll go with that. Gay rights. No. No, I don't know where they're getting that, but this book calls gay people the F word, the other F word, F-A-G, over and over and over again. Uh, I think I looked it up. I think it's something like 27 times. None of them are characters. Like there are no gay characters. Well, no, there's one. I'm sorry. There is, there is one. There is a, there is one, um, one prominent gay character is the woman that Jennifer has a relationship with in Europe. But that feels like it's okay because like lesbians are like sexier, like at the time. That feels like the safe way to put a gay character in a book in the 60s. It's true. There are not, right. There are not, but, but what's interesting is that this book is very popular in the gay community. So I read uh, an essay by Simon Doonan, who both writes the intro for my book and wrote a piece for Slate.com, I think around the 50th anniversary of the book. Yes, I read, I read, yes, I read, I read them both as well. And I checked his Wikipedia page. I don't think he is the official worldwide representative of gay culture. I, I don't think they've elected anybody to do that yet. But um, he did say, or his thought was that no one, they didn't care. They were happy to be included. That there's some representation at a time when this was maybe being, when being gay was more like swept under the rug, or you had a lot of men that were gay that were in mar you know, in marriages and stuff because- It acknowledges that they exist. It acknowledges them. It acknowledges that they exist. It acknowledges that they are prominent within the world of the people in this book. They're all, they're all off screen, so to speak, or off page, but it, there are a lot there. They are mentioned rudely, but they are mentioned 27 times according to the internet. But, is, but this does have a big gay cult following. It does, and especially the movie. No, I can see, I, I'm surprised Ryan Murphy hasn't made a mini series out of this. Like I'm baffled that like this feels very much in the sort of because I, I do think somebody tried somebody did try to make a movie uh excuse me a tv show out of this at some point um, it was briefly and, a tv show and there was oh, also it was, a, it was briefly a tv show yeah, yeah and i don't think it I, I think it didn't do well there was also a sequel to the movie ago. written by robert uh ebert co-written by robert ebert the film critic called beyond the valley of the dolls that is a schlock classic like it's a 
There's a second, there is a second book as well. And I, I want to say it was maybe like started by Jacqueline, Suzanne and finished posthumously or something. And I did read it some years ago and it was terrible. It does not have the magic um, of this book. So some other things, just some other, you know, some other non-feminist things, I guess, is that we do see that our, our heroines rely on men for emotional stability and happiness, right? Like, you know, we can, again, I don't have to keep pounding it with Anne, but like, Anne has a great career in money. She doesn't have to go back to Lawrenceville. And she's, you know, lying is the only thing that will truly bring her happiness. Um, Jennifer North also does, she does, she is successful towards the end of the book, right? Like she's successful. She's famous in France. She's famous in America. She does have money. That's been her, her, and that's been her bent for like a lot of the book is that she wants to be rich because that will give her a sense of freedom because she's a gold digger, right? Basically. I mean, it's like a, a way we can put it. She's always being used. She's always being told. She's told the entire book that she is absolutely nothing but a body and a face. She is told that over and over. You have literally nothing except a great body and a face. That is all you have. And you need to use it and make it work for you now because that's all you have. And her demise is predicted. Um, I think it's by Henry Bellamy, who's basically like she needs to make her that face, her face and her body work for her because when they go, she'll have nothing. And then she's told she has she has breast cancer, they're gonna remove her breast and she kills herself, which her death is so accidentally hilarious. Like I know that it's not I I genuinely she's my she is the character that I had the most empathy with throughout the book. But in the course of one chapter, she tells Anne about this wonderful senator who she has met, who had never seen her movies and didn't want to talk to her for that and really liked her for her. And she goes on talking about this great guy that she's finally with. And then she goes into the hospital where they find a polyp, I think, under they remove her uterus. And they also find a tumor on one of her breasts while they're doing tests and they have to remove it. And the senator is told that she's in the hospital and he races to her side where she just tells him the first part, like they had to take my uterus. And then in the hammiest scene, I don't think I've ever read in any book, he falls all over her like, oh, my darling, my darling, that's fine. I don't care about your uterus at all. And then he cups her breasts and it's like, as long as these are here, we'll be happy. The only babies I care about are these two babies, baby, these two big babies right here. And then he dips out of the room with a like, you stay sweet. Don't even worry. As long as those bazongas are there, we're going to be great. <laughs> And then she kills herself the next day. It is the most ridiculous character entrance. It, it, it is ridiculous. It is an absolutely absurd scene. It is one of the campiest things I've ever seen. No character has ever been introduced and then exited from a book under more bonkers circumstances than Senator What's-His-Name, who just shows up to give this ridiculous little speech about how much he loves these these big hooters <laughs> and then he's 100%. gone 100 and she realizes that like legitimately nobody or she thinks i guess right that legitimately this is the only thing people care about for her and she <laughs> is told that over and over again the entire book and then he essentially comes in to be like i mean i do love you but mostly i love your giant hooters and if they were to go you would have nothing and it's so such a it, and, and I, it's I, horrible no and i feel genuinely horrible for jennifer the poor, I, I feel terrible for her while it's happening, while I'm reading it, but it is the most, it is the silliest character in like introduction and then exunt that I think I've ever read. And then he's gone and she kills herself, um, which is sad because she was the one who was like, throughout the book, she didn't say anything mean about anybody else. She's the nicest character like in, in her, yeah, in her interior monologue. She never trashes, she never trashes, no, she never trashes yeah. anybody. She's a very good friend to both Neely and Anne. Yeah, she is. She, even her she's like constantly interior. constantly sending money, money to her mom and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like she's always working. And her mom apparently just like, like her mom, it seems like could be doing something else. She just like wants to use Jennifer for money. She's made Jennifer feel bad mm -hmm. that she like exists and that she had to like feed and clothe her until she was old enough to be hot enough to be like, now please go use your body to make me money and to pay for things for me. And like she, and, and, and she just does it right. Like that's part of why Jennifer is always working so much and always trying to make money is in part so she can support her mom. Yeah. Right. And, and, and she dies under the, under the fact that like 
I'm only loved for my body and now that's about to go and I have legitimately nothing left. And that is horrible. And, you know, again, I kind of just pointed to her character or the depth of the character in this point of the depth of her character in this sort of salacious novel, though. She doesn't have anything mean to say about anyone except herself. Throughout the book, she refers to herself as being talentless and not really good for much several times. She is the only person she offers an ill word about throughout oh, the book. That's interesting. Yeah. And then and then when the senator doesn't it when it turns out she's wrong yet again about like where someone about finds her man. value. Yeah. Um she kills herself. And and I would gotta say what surprised me also about that scene was that there were still like two hundred pages to go. Yes. This it is it is a long book, but I have to say I was compelled for all of it. I wouldn't go through and take out parts of this book. No, I I, I ripped through it. Um, I don't think there's any. I wouldn't go through and edit something to be like, oh, I thought this was like superfluous to like the story, or I wasn't interested in this. Like all of it to me is like deserves to be in this book. It's all interesting. I don't know. Anytime it's all interesting. A book, yeah. Anytime like, a book nothing. is this long, though, I feel like you could have cut something. But who am I to say that about one of the highest one of the highest selling highest books. selling novels in history? So up up through so 2016 was its 50th anniversary, and it was still one of the one of the highest selling books in publishing, the highest selling fiction book in publishing. That's incredible. I mean, there's like like those stupid Shakespeare plays, they make you buy those in school across the nation. You're required to buy them and they're still not competing with this. That's, with Valley that's, of the Dolls. Yeah, that's nuts. So something, okay. So again, our, our heroines, like they're relying on men for like emotional stability and, and, and their happiness. Um, I, I kind of feel that they are punished for their ambition a, a little bit. I mean, I think that's, that's part of it, but here's something that I thought was that I that I found to be sort of wild that I found in my research. So Jacqueline Suzanne was quoted as saying, Valley of the Dolls showed that a woman in a ranch house with three kids had a better life than what happened up there at the top. Yeah, I'll give her that. Yeah. Making this kind of a cautionary tale. Which brings me to which brings me to something that I was sort of struck by in reading in reading this book or again like in, in in peeling back like this this was a deeper read for me for this book right like that's been the difference I think in this read um and then for my other years of reading this is like you know sometimes I'll finish like a more intense like literary book and it's like I think I deserve a little treat and I'm gonna reread Valley of the Dolls right like I want this little like anti-literary treat, I guess. And so in this, it's like, you know, like I'm looking at this of like, why do I like this? Why do other people like this? Why is this book so popular? There's a really interesting dichotomy with all three of these women. Um, and there is this, and, and that to me is this push and pull between these women of wanting more and whatever more means for them. So for Anne, it's a little bit of this like benevolent or this 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 miasmic more. We don't really know exactly what it is she wants. She wants to be outside of Lawrenceville. Um, but she has everything and she still wants more, right? But this wanting of more. So, you know, for Jennifer, it's it's money and like some sort of sense of like security and freedom. Um, for Neely, it's all those things. It's a career, it's fame, it's adoration, it's it's money, it's security. So they want this more. They want this, this, this other thing that women aren't really being offered or not offered easily at this time. But then they do also want this like traditional like love, family and children. But what I think is interesting about it is like it's not this drive. There is this drive for for like romantic love, I suppose, in all three of them. They do mention it a lot. That is something all three of them want. But the family aspect to me, they don't want to be mothers. No. They want children. In this way, that's like maybe a thing that they're supposed to want, or it's like the children will give them like the love that they are not receiving on, on in, in anywhere else, right? Like they're, you know, they're either not receiving it from the public, they're not receiving it from their chosen men. Um, Neely is basically an orphan, right? Like she was in foster systems and stuff until her sister takes her in. Um, neither of them had, uh, Neely, excuse me, Jen and Anne do not have happy childhoods. They don't they don't feel particularly loved or wanted in their childhood homes. 
So there is just like this push and pull, right? Of this like traditional, like family and sense of love with wanting more, but they don't want to be mothers. They want children in this very like other aspect that I don't fully grasp. It's, it's like, it's to replace something that they don't have. And I think that that, that, and that is just something I read in this book that, that I read in this read that I thought was really interesting. They also don't, the book doesn't talk about it a ton. Like it, it's not, um, of the things they don't want, it's not high on the list. Like they don't really go after it real hard. Like they don't, they don't dog, they don't, they don't dog it a lot. Yeah, like Jennifer North has a kid with Tony Poehler because she's not happy, right? Like it's like, oh, I'm here, like I'm, I'm here in Hollywood with Tony Poehler. Now I'm just a wife. She wants the kid because she wants something to do. And I don't really have like my own thing and like our relationship yeah. isn't great. She wants something yeah. to do. She wants yeah. something to, she says it, she wants something to love and that will love her. She wants to give the love that she didn't receive. She wants to give love that's like, she's not able to like really give or receive from Tony in this case, but she doesn't like want a kid. She doesn't really want to be a mother. She's, she's just, the kid fills a void for her. Neely has kids because like the studio wants her to, because it's like a nice picture for her to be married to Ted Casablanca, this other famous guy in Hollywood. And for them to have children, it just gives. He raises them. Like America, this pretty little picture of like, oh, she's this sweet girl. She's married to this like nice famous man. She has yeah. these kids because she's supposed to. And then he raises them, right? Like she doesn't really have anything to do with them. She doesn't. She, it doesn't appear that she, she doesn't live and breathe for them the way we we see in mothers that we hear mothers are are supposed to feel about their children, and Anne just wants Anne knows that she doesn't really have Lion and she wants a kid because it would be yeah, it would be Lion right. It gives her a part of him that can't be taken away from her, that can't be changed, and that will give her what she thinks unconditional love and that she can love unconditionally. Because Lion has all sorts of conditions in their in their love and their relationship, but none of their ambition for for love and marriage in the traditional sense is is in the traditional sense, right? Like they don't want to be mothers, they don't want to be housewives, but they do want that 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 bigger picture or or whatever. They do want that picture or something like in their brain. Did anyone want to be a housewife and a mother? I feel like now you and I talking about this in twenty twenty four mama culture is like such a thing in the 40s where this begins in the 60s where it ends did people it's just an assumption that that, that this is yeah. what women do like i i honestly think it's been i think it's honestly been in the past but like parent culture wasn't what it is now where it was like oh my god i have to like shower this thing with love and i have to make sure that it goes to baseball and it does all this stuff like wasn't parenting in wasn't parenting in general just sort of a like, look, you got to. No, I don't think so. This is the like children. This is children are seen and not heard kind of. Yeah, that's I, it's so funny because I thought about that expression like some months ago that like you don't hear that anymore. And we and I mean, we weren't, you know, we were raised in the 80s and I don't. I remember that being a little bit of like a jokish thing that you said about kids, but it wasn't necessarily how kids were viewed. And it wasn't until I was older that I understood that like that did used to be the thing. Like, like, yes, parent culture, I think, wasn't quite so like, oh, you like live and die for your children and everything that you do and think should be, you know, based around your children or whatever. Like, I think people loved their kids, but you, but you had children for a purpose of usefulness. Like, someone needs to work on this farm, and kids are a good way to get those people. Well, yes, and then there also was just, like, the, fam the family values and the family ideals. Someone needs to carry yeah, on the like family Yeah, like, there's, like, the name. family values and the family ideals and, like, the 50s, right, of just, like, right. this, is, this is what a family is. This is, like, you, your life track is that you, you know, men go to college. Women, women maybe go to college so that you can find a man, or you wait for to graduate from college or whatever. Even that, I think, is new though. That's that is in our lifetimes. Like, I think you in get, you get married and you have children, and that is what life is. And then your children have children, and you're a grandparent, and then you die, and your family continues on. And those were just the choices for people. I don't think that anybody was looking at this as like a choice of like, do I want to have children? Is this a thing that like I want to do? Do I want to have them so badly? I think it's just what came next. 
And I think it's been in the last like 20 or 30 yeah. years, like, you know, our, our generations like are having less children. And as somebody who is choosing not to have children, part of it is just like, I understand that it is a choice and that I don't have to do this. And I don't particularly have the yearning to be a mother or to, or to, to have children. It's, it's not something I've ever wanted to do. And I know in this day and age that that is a choice I have. But this is a conversation that comes up with with women that are older than me. And I see that it's like, I see this like bafflement that I can just choose that. Like, of like, but why? Like, there must be a reason. Like, you can't have children. It's like, I assume that I could have children. I'm choosing to not have them. I think this book takes place in an, in an era where for the first time in in America anyway, in the United States where this takes place, for the first time, modern life had caught up to a point where you did not need to have children. Like this, these are the first people who have hit a point where like, there's not really, I don't need to do this. I think prior to that in the late 1800s, again, someone has to run this farm right. and 20 and, you know, we're having 10 because seven are going to die of yellow fever or whatever obscure disease just swept across the prairies back then taking out half the population. I think in the early 1900s, there was still like someone's got to like take over this cracker factory that I've built. And it was just, you had kids because you needed more people to be around to do things. I think this book takes place in that first, the the point where modern on we first becomes like an actual thing where modern conveniences and modern lifestyles and urban living and suburban living brought us to a point where like women had the kids they looked around this beautiful home and they're like, why do I, what, I don't, this is. Right. Do, I, do I have to be doing, like, do we have to be doing this? What am I supposed to be doing? This is kind of a drag. Yeah. Do I have to do this? I don't. You just, you're right. I don't really have a farm to put this kid on. He's just around the house all the time. Um. Yeah. Like I, I just, I found that <laughs> I, to be a really interesting dichotomy that like, there's this, this want of more with this one of like, but do I want the traditional thing? But then, like I said, as like I was reading this of like, these women don't want to be mothers. They want children for various reasons, but I, but I do not feel that their want of having, of, of wanting to have children. It's not yeah. a prominent thing in the book. It's not something they're super pushing for. It's it, there, there are other reasons, but I do not think that these are characters that want to be mothers in, in at least particularly not in the way that we look at mothers to your point and th today or in the past, you know, in our lifetime, as it were. Do you think the author of this book, Jacqueline Suzanne, likes her characters? We know that she doesn't like Miriam. Any of them? I know she doesn't like Miriam. We've established that. But she does she like any of the others? I feel like you made the point that she was like, this book shows that like, um, a housewife with three kids in the suburbs has a better life than these people at the top. And it made me kind of wonder, is is this one of those books that's like meant to point out that like at the end of the day, the conservative conservative in the sense of like uh, not in the political sense, just a conservative in the sense of a safer, more even, less risky uh, path. But is this one of those pieces of media that is like at the end of the day, the conservative family path, the American nuclear family unit is really what you should be doing. I know that the readers are just sort of like, this is great. This is nuts. Like we're not necessarily taking that away from it. But do you think that the author's point is that like these are people are bad and you should you should stay in Lawrenceville and you, you would you would have made it in Lawrenceville? Maybe, but like that wasn't her life. I don't think that she, I don't think she had children. No, she, does she have children? She did have a oh, she does have a kid. Uh, no, she had one. He was diagnosed with autism, whatever that meant in the 60s. I don't know. I, I don't know what that diagnosis encompassed back then. And he was put into a home for the rest of his life. Oh, yes, I did read that. But in that case, she did not have a, you know, but that's not the traditional like American nuclear family in the fifties that we are looking at it. And that like, leave it to be, leave it to Beaver, Donna Reed show fifties nuclear family. Like that's. No. And they were also rich. They lived on like Central Park West or something like that. Um, they, they were rich. She, as we discussed, has, she has a sense of celebrity. She has a sense of fame. She clearly has this, this sense of, of you know, like age and beauty and, and what, and what those things, you know, what those things mean. I I looked up what Irving Mansfield, her 
Am I saying his name? Yeah, Irving Mansfield. What he what he had produced. A bunch of random things that le- left very little cultural impact, from what I would guess. There's something in here called the Frank Sinatra Show. I know who that is, but the rest of this. Stop me if you've heard this one. This is show business. The Polly Bergen Show. Star Time. Face the Facts. The TV series. The Love Machine. Once is not enough. And then he produced, he was an executive producer on the miniseries based on the book called Jacqueline Suzanne's Valley of the Dolls, which came out in 1981 after her death. There's been so much TV between now and then. I mean, who, who knows? Those things might have been popular at the time. Some of those things might have been popular at the time and done well at the time and have just gotten lost. Sure. I didn't, none of them are Leave it to Beaver. None of them were on Nick at Night. None of them are, are ones that have like lasted that we like know and talk about them today. No, and I'm sure, I mean, someone, I saw there's a television show coming out uh, that Anthony Anderson is the host of where a celebrity's sibling will come out and sing a song and then people will guess what celebrity they're related to, which is the most end of empire abomination, like the worst television concept I've ever heard of. Um, But someone's the producer of that and they'll get paid for it. And yeah, I can't wait to not see it. So someone, so someone we haven't talked about very much, Neely. Neely goes from being the sweet little sister type downstairs reading Gone with the Wind in their rooming house or whatever kind of apartment women were allowed to live in alone back in the 40s because it was a different time. She goes from the sweet little sister type downstairs to immediately being a horrible person mm-hmm. who is cheap, like within 15 minutes of being in LA is cheating on her husband. Who scheme, she schemes to get rid of him and be able to keep money, right? Like she, she in the, she in the head scheme to have him caught. He gets out so easy compared to other, other people in this book. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to talk about, uh, the head, the head of the studio who they affectionately call the head. I love that he is described over and over yeah. again as this like sweet little old man, this like sweet little old man. He's a sweet little old man. And then he's 50. Yeah. The ages in this are wild. The ageism, the ageism in the, in the, the weightism, the fattest, the fattest in this book are, I mean. But every man in this book was going to drop dead of a heart attack by 63, right? Like nobody was making it to 70. I mean, the way they all in drink this... and smoke cigarettes, I guess. That's yeah. That's the thing. Um like like fifties. I mean, the is, drinking is prevalent, like, but yeah, mostly it was just that it was like, oh, like he's like this little old man. He's this little old man, and then it's like something, something, and he's fifty years old. And I was like, that's even at this time. I mean, that's still kind of like still kind of middle eight. Like Henry Bellamy's like fifty when we meet him, and he's not described as this like little man, right? And he's probably I. Oh, I guess. Um, that's... I want to say I made age. I made note of his age. I don't remember what it was, but I mean, he's he's fifty probably when this book. When this book starts, right? Or maybe he's in his like, maybe he's in his like mid forties, but he is like an adult established man who has built this business for years, yeah. you know, for years and stuff. Like he's not, um, he's not a young man as it were. And, and, he, and Lion is 30 when this book starts. So Lion is, so Lion is around 50 when this book ends. And he yeah. is not, and, and he is still a man who can just like bring Anne down into the proverbial valley of the dolls, right? Like he finally like gets Anne to start taking the dolls uh, because he's so horrible. Kid alts didn't exist yet when this book came out. Like Anne is what, she's 20 when she's, when the book starts, she's 20. So like Anne's contemporaries could have been married for like three, two to three years when Anne moves to New York. And that wouldn't be uncommon for the time, I don't think. Like when we meet Lion, he's- He's 30 when the book starts. He probably did a five-year tour in Eastern Europe. Yeah, right. No, he's been away for like, like some years in the war. Like he's he's ha- he's gone to school, had a job, left that job, and fought a world war, and then come back by the time and she's he's thirty. Twenty. Like, Neely is seventeen. Yeah, and Jen is twenty-five because she has that stint in Europe, right? And she's old, right? So she's so worried about her age at twenty-five. Like our friends didn't. Like our friend, we have friends who had still never lived without roommates at 30. Like, I think it was just a different era right. like that. A hundred percent. Like, how old do you think um, Pete, what's that guy with the asshole eyes? I'm going to need more than that. He's on Saturday Night Live. He dated Ariana Grande. Oh, Pete Davidson? How old do you think Pete Davidson is? And like, he 
30 dresses like he just rolled through he dresses like he just rolled through the kids section of target right yeah like just, okay age is age is very different like, now i mean people people say that like that didn't exist people back say that then. about our like pete davidson would not have been a thing that's true people say that about our generation though too like if you go back and look at pictures of like our parents ours and people in our our generation our age range if you go back and look at pictures of our parents when they are our age now they look much older and part of and part of it is yeah, like if you look at, and if part you, of it is like because I've, I've read some things about this that it's like our generation and stuff is aging is aging very you know is aging very differently um when well, and childhood is delayed our childhood is extended into the into the 20s really right like i mean i guess when you're 22 you think I mean, you, you think that you're an adult when you're 22, but like then you're 32 or you're 42 and you look back at 22 and it's like, like, children. But like in 1979, you could, you could have gotten out of high school and then gotten like the job you would have for the next 30 years. And like within a year of having it, you might be buying a house with no college education. Right. Because, no you, right, because you could make enough money to support, you could make enough money to be a man that supported yourself and your wife and your children and bought a house and lived middle class right on a, with no college yeah. education now when you graduate high school you're qualified okay. for exactly the same kind of jobs you would have been qualified for in right. fifth grade or the same job that you had all through high school yeah um yeah, that's yeah. The... so it, it is i mean but so so yeah so i mean I, well i do suppose that 50 then was different than 50 now it, i did just I, I laughed out loud when i read that he was 50 and like put, turned the page down of just like 50 this guy's 50 like <laughs> Stop calling him a little old man. This like sweet little old man. Let's talk about Neely. So you want to talk about Neely? She becomes the she becomes one of the one of the most villainous villains I think I've ever encountered in literature. She's an absolute monster. She's next to the judge from Blood Meridian. Like she is possibly like if I thought this book was uh, like written a little bit deeper, she could be a metaphor for like Satan on Earth. The powers of chaos. She's so mean. And I think so. I remember we talked about. Um, so when we talked about Slaughterhouse Five in our last podcast. Um, we talked about how the the whole plot of the book is up front. We know everything that's going to happen in the book in the first like twenty or thirty pages, right? Um, and so that was that was in my mind, and that actually really happened. That that's actually also a setup for this book. We are told we are told from the beginning that it is not going to work out with Anne and Lion. Oh, you mean like characters tell Anne that that it won't work out? Characters characters tell Anne that. Yes, it is apparent in the beginning. Like this, this is not going to work out. Henry Bellamy lines up like he lines up everything for her. Like if you end up with this guy, he's going to be basically married to his job. He he's there's going to be constant late nights he's going to be whining and dining his clients and you guys are going to you guys are going to grow apart and your marriage is going to end and you're not going to love him anymore and that's what's happening by the end of the book lion burke himself lion burke himself that's what he would tell, do everybody tells her everybody tells everybody tells Anne up front yeah and it and for what it's worth it is very human to want what you want and for everyone to be like this is this guy isn't going to work out for you. This isn't a good decision. And sometimes we just have to find these things out for ourselves. But he also, he also ghosts her for like for 15, 15 years, years without a word. And she doesn't take, I mean, it's not just that people tell her that and she believes, oh, well, no, they then don't he shows know. her. It actually happens. She sees it with the eyes in her face happen to her. And, she and then when he comes back, doesn't. he basically tells her, like, I'm going to do the same thing again. Like, I love you, but I love you this. I love you this much. I love you this little amount. You love me infinitely. And he tells her, like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to love you the way that you love me. And she's fine with that. But Neely, Neely tells us how, she, how she's going to be. She says... Uh, so she and Anne, this is in the beginning of the book. This is page four, 48 in my copy, but this is the beginning of the book. Um, and Anne has told her that that Alan Wells has proposed and she doesn't want to marry him. And Neely is like, what are you even doing? Why are this is, you've made it. This is it. And you're turning it down. And so Anne says, Neely, let me put it this way. You're thrilled because you've landed hit the sky. Suppose after a few weeks of rehearsal, someone like Alan came into your life and asked you to marry him and shuck the show before it even opened. Would you? Would I? But so fast it'd make your head spin. Look, let's say I have real talent and let's say someday I get a chance to prove it. 
If I work real hard for years, what will I wind up with? Money, position, and respect. That's it. That's all there is. And it could take me years of hard work to get to that. Alan is handing you the works on a silver platter. So I feel like even she knows this isn't going to be enough for her. Right? Like she she says it right. She says it right there. And this again, you know, she's never had money. Right? She's never had any of the things that that Anna's had. But she looks at it of like, like, you know, I'll get the chance to prove it, but what will I wind up with? Money, position, and respect. That's it. That's all there is. She's kind of predicting her self-destruction. It doesn't matter if I get this. I'm not going to be happy with it. And she's not. And she's not. A complaint I do have, her villainy and her cruelty is so over the top that there's a point where I'm just sort of like, for, like it, it becomes a little bit absurd. It, oh, it's because this book is very campy. Which is part of, I think, which is part of what is enjoyable about it. It crescendos. She's, I'm still with her. Uh, but my, um, my favorite scene in the book, I mean, I'm sure most people's, is when she gets in the fight with Helen Lawson in the bathroom at whatever that old 60s style club where a guy sings some Morocco, songs, a band plays, whatever, whatever it is. They get in the fight in the bathroom and she attacks her and rips her wig off. And then she locks herself in a stall and tries to flush the toilet until it overflows and the wig is ruined. And Helen Lawson has to stay in there until the entire club empties out. And Helen Lawson, prior to Neely, was so mean to everyone that you're just like, yes, yes, you had that coming. What a comeuppance. You know, it's kind of like in a nod to classic literature. Neely assumes that position from that moment on and stands on the terrible shoulders of Helen Lawson and just reaches new heights of sort of arbitrary cruelty to people around her because she is famous. So another, uh, another, this is another Neely quote. So Anne, you know, Anne has met Helen Lawson and she thinks Helen Lawson is, is fine, right? Like she likes Helen. Nobody knows the real Helen. Helen's been, you know, raw and vulnerable with me. And if other people could see that and Neely's like, nah, girl, that's not the case. Again, Anne, so naive. What's the matter I, with you? I got to tell you, I hated Anne. This whole, the whole time I was reading this book was just, I wanted to punch Anne right in the face. Um, I felt real, I had real frustration with Anne throughout this read. She's a frustrating character. She's a frustrating character. You just watch her, like you watch her be handed stuff and still, and then still do dumb stuff. Like, I don't know. It's like giving someone 50 bucks and they take half of it and like put it in a pile of dog crap for no particular reason. And you're like, you, why would you do that? You you know better. You know, that's not a, why would you, why on earth would you think that's okay? You're a regular person, right? So Neely says, and this, this is, you know, I I think this is uh, hilarious. So she's talking about, about Helen Lawson. And Anne's trying to stick up for her. She says, I don't doubt she can be tough when she's working. That's her job. She has to fight for what she wants, but divorce her from her work. And you'll find a sensitive, lonely woman longing for a real friend and for someone to love. Love nearly screeched. And the real Helen Lawson is the monster I see at rehearsals. And it has nothing to do with being a star. She was born that way. You don't get that way. Why, if I was ever a star, I'd be so darn grateful that an audience loved me, that people would pay just to see me, that writers would write for me. Wow. I'd go around kissing the world. And she does not. not. But I do think it's interesting that she says it has nothing to do with being a star. She was born that way. You don't get that way. And I feel like that's, but I feel like that's Neely because Neely does have, she has this like, this selfish self-destructive tendency. And that's what we see when she's given the opportunity. When she's famous, when she gets to be a star, that's what comes out, right? That she is, you know, like she says, you know, like with, with the fame, when she, when she gets it and it's like, that's it. I have money, I have fame, I have power and respect, but that's it. Like, you know, where, where do you go from here? And for Anne, I think maybe that's, maybe that's what we see in Anne, right? That Anne has, Anne has all of those things. Anne always has those things. She always has respect. Everybody respects her. She's she's classy. She's reserved. She's not she's not body and loud like Helen Lawson or like Neely, you know, who's like a little bit unrefined. Jennifer, nobody cares about anything that comes out of Jennifer's mouth because of how she looks. So like she doesn't have respect. Anne has respect and money in the beginning. Anne has respect, money, and fame. 
and has respect, money, and fame, and power. She has one thing that she can't have, and it's lying. So she's also at the top looking around like, I have all of this, and it's not worth it, or it's 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 not enough. It's not. She wants more. She wants the one thing she can't have, and so does Neely. What do you think about Neely's betrayal at the end? I struggled with it. I've come to terms with it. But when I first read the last, whatever it is, 20 pages, where we go through the Neely gets I think out we of see the it in the beginning. institution. She slims down. She starts having an affair with Lion. And the book ends with Lion leaving her, but having an affair with somebody else. But she has an, a, Neely has an affair with the husband of one of her two best friends over decades. She owes Anne her fame and her career. Anne gets yes, her into does. Hit the Sky. Anne gets her a bigger part yep. in Hit the Sky. And lets her stay yep. at her apartment all of the time and save and saves yes. her right she tries she um she accidentally overdoses in Anne's apartment and uh, her life is saved because Anne is so worried about like leaving Neely at home that she comes back and finds Neely like almost dead in her apartment and calls and calls an you know calls an ambulance they they get her taken to you know they get her taken to a hospital that is in Bellevue right they pretend it's an accident even though they know it's not so that she doesn't get submitted to a sanitarium and pays for her to go to a sanitarium when she clearly needs it. I think so. That was what I finally went back to that. I was like, that's why she's the sanitarium. That's why she's. It's the resentment of being locked away in the funny farm, as she puts it. I think it's right like, there in the beginning. When, of she, the book. when she was told when she was told she went in that she was going in for the sleep therapy, the sleep treatment. And then Anne left her in there for like six a months. Year. I think she's in there for I like think a year. That's in there for a long time. I think, yeah, I think that's why she comes out and just, I think that's how she I think justifies. that's probably how she justifies it. But I think that betrayal is right there in the beginning of the book in those quotes that I just read. Yeah. yeah. Anne has everything handed to her in the beginning and continually is not happy that's with true. it and throws it away. And I think that by the end of the book, Neely's had it. She continues to run back to I mean Anne. She continues to run back to Anne. I mean, you and I, you, you and I had it with Anne by the end of the book. So, yeah. I had it with Anne by the end of the book. I mean, I guess, I guess Neely comes by. Neely it, honestly. comes by it a little more honestly. I think by the end of the book, she's just like, you know what, Anne? Screw you. You have these these millionaires keep asking you to marry them, and you're turning them down. You you've never had to, you've never had to work for anything. Everything has been handed to you. Mi- very nice millionaire men who genuinely love and respect you offer to marry you. And you keep turning it down and screwing it up for this like one guy who clearly doesn't want you. You could have everything. And I think by the end, she has just had it and wants to take one of the things that Anne has. This is what Anne has like, you know, and Anne is willing to throw away. Anne knows that Lion's going to find out that she paid for his share. She is manipulative. manipulative. Like it is, she seems very, that isn't something that's going to stay a secret. No, her character is consistently, uh, consistently designing machinations for other people and manipulating people into things that she would like, that she would like, that they very clearly have told her like it's not implied it's not metaphor they have specifically said i do not want this and she finds ways to make it or to try to make it happen the way she would like it to happen against their wishes like she kind of changes lion for the better right and that like in him following his like in him following his his joy of like wanting to write and stuff like we see we see what kind of man he or we hear i guess i should say what kind of man he was when he works for henry bellamy prior to going away for world war ii he he sleeps with helen lawson right like helen throws that in her face mm-hmm. he sleeps with helen lawson because she's famous and he knows it's like good for the business and understands that like she just wants to lay anything in pants as uh as Neely describes her in the beginning so he does and like and henry and henry knows that and sees that and so she kind of sets line on this different path of like this isn't what if this isn't what you want to be if you feel that you're changed, you're a different person from the war, and this isn't the, what, what you want to be, then like go be the thing you want to be. And he does, but doesn't include her. He, he tries, tries to. to. He tries to. He does. She actually, she just doesn't get every, like she can have Lion 
She can have the writer. She can have him be the better man that he is. She just can't have it in Manhattan. And, and I think coming back to sort of like, is this a feminist book? She wants what she wants. Good point. Like the character is a, the character is allowed to be like, no, I. And she does. She buys Lion, essentially. And also, I mean, we're kind of crapping on her, but like, she's not being, she doesn't want to stay in Lawrenceville. It's not wild what she's suggesting to Lion. Like, why can't you just write in New York where we both already live, where I found you an apartment that's big enough for both of us? Because Lion consistently like talks about himself as though he's not responsible for his own actions. Like there's always he's not responsible for his own choices. Like, oh, it's 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 not my fault, Anne, it's that I can't do this. It's that pride of mine, you know? Like it just ah, if it wasn't for my pride, we could totally do the thing you're suggesting. But I don't know, my pride, what are you gonna do? Like Right, because he doesn't want her to he doesn't want her paying their their way. But he also says it like, just like, you know, pride, what are you going to do? It's not like I can change myself. It's not like I could make a decision as an adult man and just not do the thing that we've clearly right. laid out here. I tell you, yeah, I love you, know, you and that I would says, love to marry you and have a life with you, but I'm setting up all of these parameters in which that can't happen. And it's, but it's out of my Yeah, hands. he makes I, up these things. Yeah, he he talks about his pride like it's an incoming snowstorm that he can't right. do anything about. Like just, oh, you know, the snow, it's going to happen. She does get the chance to have him. Her suge- she's not being unreasonable when she's like, I'm sorry, why can't we just go back to the apartment that we're always at anyway? I bought you a typewriter. Type your book on that in the apartment we already have in the city we both like. Just do that instead of I have to move all the way back here to Lawrenceville to the house where my mother died. And like you can only write here by this fireplace looking right. out that window. However, and then Henry talks her out of like going back to England with Lion. Like when he comes back to New York and she dumps Kevin Gilmore, she does like Henry kind of talks her out of like, no, no, no. You know, if you go to London, the apartment isn't very nice and like you won't be happy there. And it's like, but if all she wants is Lion, like she she really could have just gone to England with him. Yeah. She has dumb problems. I mean Lion is part of the dumb problems. She's got money. They're never going to starve. Like, I understand he's all like, I need to pay my own way. I got to pay for you. I got to pay for you and for me. Cause like, I'm a man in the fifties and the sixties. And that's what this is. But like, she could have just gone to England and like lived poorly. I mean, who, who can't like, if this is, if, if Lion is all you want, which is what she says over and over again. Right. I don't care about this. I don't care about money. I don't care about this. Then just go to England and like live in his crappy flat in England and carry an umbrella a lot. I don't like if all you want is lying, what difference does it make? But Henry talks her out of that for what it's worth. Henry also tells her that like that won't work, but it like looking at that, it's like, but wouldn't it? No, a lot of it seems like it would. I mean, the part of this book that I thought was actually genuinely satirically funny was Lion the writer. Like, I'm sorry, Anne, I can only write under certain circumstances in a certain situation, and it's where I'm paying my own way, and you don't have any money, and I have a typewriter that sits over here, and it has to be, And like, he's not a very good writer. He's not a good writer. Like, his book, like, his books, his books don't sell. Nobody cares about his books. The only person buying his books is Anne. I, Anne keeps buying his books and making her friends read his crappy yeah. books. <laughs> and, like, no yeah. one else cares about his I, books. <laughs> I think if you haven't even written your crappy novel yet, and the only place you can write your crappy novel is like under a very specific set of circumstances, like a house in Lawrenceville where your partner doesn't make as much money as you, and then you can sit down by a fireplace in this one style of house in this one kind of town, and then you can write your crappy novel. Like your novel was never going to be very That's good. Fair. I thought all of that was very funny. Every time she suggests something normal when he's like, I'm going to be a writer. And she's like, oh, great. I'll buy you a typewriter. And he's like, no, I have to find the typewriter. And I need to be poor. I need to come across the typewriter with the last $10 I got. And then I'll buy it. And she's like, I just have a paycheck. I could just go well, get you a typewriter. He also has a paycheck. Like he's working for Henry Bellamy. Just buy your own typewriter. No, I, no, no. See here, Anne, the only way I can write is if I don't use that Henry Bellamy money, my pride would never allow it. That money has to go somewhere else. It can't be a part of my writing. I can't just, I can't just write on the side while I go to my full-time job, like lots of other people do when they're writing their first novel. Like, 
What do you mean take all this money I've saved and spend a year writing my novel? No, Anne, I just couldn't do it. You don't understand. If I ever, if I see Henry Bellamy in the same city that I'm in, the novel won't work. The novel just won't work, Anne. Like I found all just that reasons to not be with Anne, and Anne needs to, and Anne needs to see that. <laughs> like I've had a note, I have a note somewhere in this book that like Lion Burke is the original, as the kids would say, fuck boy. Like right, he just he's very upfront yeah. of like no, I'm never going boy. to love That's you exactly what the way is. that you love me. I'm incapable of the kind of love that you have for me. I'm not going to be a good husband. I don't want the same things that you do. And Anne just keeps being like, well, okay, but could we get married and live here in New York? And he just keeps being like, like, no, that's not a thing that we're going to do. And she's like, cool. Dude, well, what if we his, par- his parameter, His parameters for marrying her is he has to have written the first book and it has to have done sort of okay. And then the second book needs to do slightly better. And then only then if the second book has done slightly better and he's got a third one in the works, then he will marry her. Like this Rube Goldberg esque set of things that all have to happen with his career, his writing career before he can marry her. Uh, and yeah, she's just sort of like, she just goes, she just along, goes with along with it. it. But back to Neely, because yeah. Neely, I feel like, because Neely, I do think, though, has, like, the most interesting character arc. Uh, uh, right? I mean, she, yeah, to I mean, your she, point that she starts out this, like, sweet little girl. She's downstairs, like, eating her cookies and, like, reading Gone with the Wind. You know, she picks her stage name as, like, O'Hara, and they think it's funny because she's, like, just read Gone with the Wind. She feels like, inspired by Scarlett yeah. O'Hara because she's, like, young and naive. She has this this talent, you know, she she's legitimately talented. And then to your point, literally as soon as she's famous, becomes an absolute monster. She overthrows, like all we hear in the beginning of the book is how much she loves Mel, right? And that Mel does legitimately seem to yeah. be this just decent guy who like loves her and cares about her. She convinces him to come out to Hollywood with her. Like, I can't do it without you. So he goes out there with him and she just like immediately throws him over. Oh, yeah, they've been there like a month. And she and like and a lot of her problems, as it were, is because she's a terrible worker. So like she goes on and on. So like we we're set up in the beginning where I feel like we get the Helen Lawson character is like a foreshadow for Neely, for what Neely's going to become. Like, yeah. that's pretty I mean, that's pretty obvious to anyone who's taken an English class before. Like we kind of see that. But Helen Lawson consistently works. She says it herself of like, mm-hmm. I, I don't like, I don't go out on nights that I have shows or like, I don't drink on nights that I have shows. Like I get up and I have, she's very specific. Rebecca, she does not, on nights where she has a show, a matinee the next day, she does not go oh, out. She does not hoot. go out and hoot. That's right. She refers to having a big time as going out and, and you know hooting. what? I did. And, ne- and now I and do now too. I, and now I'm also going to use that. <laughs> like she does not go out and hoot when she yes. has a matinee. Helen Lawson shows up and works hard. Right. Yeah. Like that is something that we can say. She's still working. I believe she's, she's still, still working, working at the end, at the end of the, of the novel. novel. She's still on Broadway. Yeah. She's not made it to like TV or anything because as we're told over and over again in the book, she's old, she's old and fat, you know, like she just, she gets older and fatter as the book goes on apparently, which is the most unacceptable thing that any woman could ever do, which would be to age or look at those she's easy. they keep calling her old iron they keep signs. calling her old iron signs it's so rude but helen lawson is a professional through and through right she shows yeah. up and she works hard it's the reason her career lasts neely sucks right neely but, but her but her pictures bring in a lot of money because and she, she but they don't because she doesn't show up on time and they have the to like reshoot up. things because her weight goes up and down um or because she's well, she makes the production go so long that it goes, it goes way, way over budget. budget it doesn't for whatever. Actually like they're they're huge successes, but like making them is such a slog with her that they end up costing more than a wild success. Right, because she's because she's a monster. She's un, she's unprofessional. Yeah. She's not hardworking. She just is talented. She pe- people enjoy her. People enjoy whatever little like child like sparkle that she brings to the stage, and you know she's got a decent voice. Um, but she's a horrible person and like a horrible worker, right? Like everything that goes wrong, she does bring on herself. Oh, everything. Yeah. I will say though, I'm not defending her. She's a monster. She's clearly meant to be a monster. She's a villain throughout the book. I think we see in the beginning of the book that she is going to be a monster. Those little seeds. You have a neely hot take? This isn't a hot take. 
how this isn't a defense of Neely in any capacity, but something that I do, something that I do think lends towards the feminism of this book is how put through the ringer these women are, not Anne necessarily, but Jennifer and and Neely, like how everything is, how everything is based on their looks, how, you know, how everything is based on, on what they look like and on their age. She is, wor- I mean, she has worked really hard, right? Like there is this, like, they, they want her, Hollywood wants her to, to be presented in a certain way. So she like has this big house that she's paying for. They want her to have those kids, those twins and like take care of them. But like, even then kids cost money to have she's making money for agents she's making money for the studio right like and they are just like working her day and night like we do see a little bit of that of like what she's going through um and like and, and what when, and when she when she when she has the the contretemps with her s- second husband the guy she has ted the kids Casablanca. with who had been her ted casablanca um she talks about it where she's just like seven days a week she's on the studio set like rehearsing going through bits filming like she's never home she never sees anybody she's like working 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 working. working. they like they're you know they start like they start they set her up with the the studio sets her up with like this house then as she gets famous they set her up with like this bigger house but like she's expected to pay for all of that right like they're not giving her those things um they're expecting her to like make to make this money to support you know you support all of the people that are around you your agents and um your your costumer and stuff right like the, there's all of these people that are making money off you as a celebrity so again I, her behavior is off the charts her she is an absolute monster um and she she's an absolute monster for one we see that and that is compounded by a pretty massive her husband is also having affairs and her husband is having affairs but that is ted casablanca not mel the second the husband, second ted husband. Casablanca. he's having a he's having affairs right like kind of like helen lawson she continues men, men men and women like she is like neely is going neely is uh going through relationship drama that is not that is solely not solely based on her. of her creation um but so yeah. she like she is she's been she's being you know she's being really put through it. it is a challenging industry where she's expected to maintain like the weights in this book like i highlighted some of them and I don't remember the numbers off my head now, but like um, when she gets out to Hollywood, I want to say she's like, oh, you know, I weigh, I weigh 108 pounds. That's really little. And they want her to lose 10 pounds and be 98 pounds. And I, they go, they, they say her height, 108 is very thin. 108 is super thin for whatever the height is for her. And they get her started on those pills. Uh, they get her started with like the Dexedrine or whatever to um to lose weight right like those pressures are there we're consistently told how important looks and weight are throughout this entire book and that is part of her downfall so i think that she's a monster from the beginning i think like she says about helen lawson like this isn't created she was born this way and then happened to get famous and she's a monster and neely is that way too but i do think part of the feminism of this book is what women are put through to, to be ambitious that it that it is it is harder for women to make it to the top, basically. I think it, yeah, I think it does a good job of showing the, like things are not handed to Neely. Anne helps Neely get a leg up, but she's already working. She's already putting herself through the entertainment grind and she gets herself up there and she has put through a lot. Helen Lawson has put through a lot. It's hard work and they do work hard at it. Um, I don't think us as the reader hate Neely until... I don't really hate Neely we, until until she has the affair with until Lyon. she. Because otherwise, you yeah, feel sorry. Yeah, that's when for she her. goes from. Well, and you're aware that she is behaving badly, but I don't. I am more on the side of like she has gone through things. Her, her husband was having affairs on her. She was cheating on her previous husband with this guy. Like she was not been a perfect person, but like. She is also not the sole creator of the things going on around her. She's a contributor, but she is not solely responsible for every single thing that is difficult about her life. Um, It's not until she betrays her friend that she knows loves this guy, like that she demands that Lion be with her, like that she deliberately does it. 
that I think as a reader, me as a reader anyway, was just sort of like, oh, like she surpassed a point of like, I can't read her empathetically anymore. She's not, no, you can't be empathetic towards her once that's when you, that's when you as the reader, like turn on her or, or really start to see her, I think as the villain, because you do read with this sense of empathy. And again, this is, this is someone who was an orphan. This is someone who was raised in foster systems. And while that's not addressed in this, in this book, certainly like that's, that's a real rude entry into life. When she fights Helen Lawson in the bathroom, I was cheering for her. I was right there with her. Helen Lawson starts talking shit about her kids, and she's just like, what? I was, I was, they're like, go get her. Do not let her sit. Your children? How dare she? Get after her. Yeah, get that wig. Get after her. I'm glad you flushed her wig. I'm glad she has to stay in the bathroom for the rest of the night. It's around the time she goes into the, into the asylum, and she's not being very gracious about anything anyone does. And then when she comes out, it really ramps up. That was when, that was when I, as a reader, was like, I no longer have empathy for Neely, regardless of what she might have gone through, or, you know, how put upon she's been as a very famous person who is also very rich. So, Rebecca, would you recommend this book to? I would readers? absolutely recommend this book. It is a, it is a, it just a fun, engaging. Um, it's a fun, engaging comfort read. I'm not going to build this as some sort of like awesome literature. But something I like about it, you know, chiclet or, you know, chiclet as it's as it's known today or as we looked at today is always wrapped up in this like neat little bow where everything works out just like great in the end for like our plucky little heroine. And this is not that. And I feel like that is another part of the reason that I like this, that I like this book. Oh, it's a it's a it's a grim ending. And that is, I, I like that about this book. I like that it is a book about women and how it can be hard to be a woman and it can be great to be a woman and all of the things in between. And I would absolutely, I, this book is a popular classic for a reason. This book is a best selling fiction book for a reason. And if you have not read it, I absolutely would recommend uh, picking this one up. I would also recommend it. I really enjoyed reading it. I think that it doesn't lose anything with age. Like 50 years, like besides the fact that there's, some terminology we don't use anymore and no one has a cell phone. I, a lot of it, I think is still the big, relevant. The big themes like in I this book are, are timeless. Like I said, yeah. they're, they're things that are consistently being talked about and of interest. Yeah. All right. So what are we doing next? So I believe our next book is going to be parable of the sower. Another first read. It'll be another it. first read for Kennedy. It'll be a second read for me. I actually did read it recently. What are you going to do? You really loved it. Copy? I'm going to have to go to the. I'm going to go to the library and get a library copy and put and fill it with post-it notes because I won't be able to dog ear the pages. All right. So we'll see you all next time. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you for a parable of the summer.